Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode where we're going to be talking about the unity of science. I just realized as I went live that I forgot to ask the correct pronunciation of your first name as well, because it's like, is it like the Scandinavian pronunciation of Thomas or T Thomas? That's that's exactly right, Nathan. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I, I call myself Thomas half of the time, so no worries. So I'm, I'm here with uh, the author of the Unity of Science Cambridge Elements book, uh, Thomas Tarko, uh, and you're the professor of metaphysics uh, of metaphysics of science at Bristol University and the principal investigator of the Meta Science Research uh, Project there. Do you want to talk a little bit about what it is that you guys do before we get into it? Yeah, very briefly, I can I can mention something. So um, we've been having this uh, this project on uh, the full name is the Metaphysical Unity of Science, Meta Science for short, um, a project funded by the European Research Council where we uh, look at things that are relevant for this question about uh, the unification of the sciences. Um, so this has been going since uh, late 2018, so it's well in its uh, in its maturity now. And uh, there's a team of three postdocs and a PhD student. And uh, uh, we're, we're looking at this question from a, mainly from the point of view of uh, the various um, interfaces between the, the natural sciences. So uh, you might start from uh, the interface between biology and chemistry, for instance, or biochemistry, and uh, go on to look at the interface between chemistry and physics and ask uh, what uh, kind of connections do these sciences have. And uh, we're trying to apply uh, the sort of metaphysical toolbox that that uh, we share to these uh, case studies from the sciences. So that's uh, that's kind of what, uh, what the main daily day to day of the project is. So the first question then, which is mostly for people who haven't kind of heard of the unity of science before. I mean, what is it that we're talking about here when we talk about the unity of science? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I mean, uh, it probably gives all sorts of ideas, um, uh, just the, the notion of unity of science. But in, in philosophy, um, it has a very specific history. So it goes back to this uh, 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 project uh, that uh, was perhaps set in motion by um, uh, logical empiricism and positivist and the Vienna circle, but they didn't really use this notion of unity of science. Uh, it's uh, Oppenheim and Putnam's famous paper from 1958, uh, where this sort of title gets its uh, most famous uh, use. I mean, it was used before that as well um, uh, by people like uh, like Carnap. Um, so uh, what what is this unity of science supposed to be? Well, the traditional idea is that uh, it is uh, uh, something that explains um, uh, the common background between all the sciences, or that's the ideal anyway. So um, often this is connected with, with reduction, the notion of reduction, which I, I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit, uh, and uh, gives a sort of um, hierarchical view of reality where you might start from the higher level sciences, let's say psychology, economics, and go to uh, biology, chemistry, and end up with, with fundamental physics. And the thought might be that uh, you uh, might be able to explain all that's going on in these various sciences just by uh, referring to fundamental physics in the end. So that's the sort of extreme reductionist idea that uh, uh, goes um, goes together often with, uh, with the notion of unity of science. Now, uh, with the same breath, I must say that uh, nowadays, this type of idea is, of course, very unpopular. And uh, not very many people at all would, would hold to this sort of old idea of unity of science. So it has a bit of a bad name, maybe. But uh, what I try to show in this, uh, in this element, I think I have a physical copy here as well that I can advertise. Nice. <laughs> is, uh, is that uh, what, what I try to show is that there's still room for unity of science, uh, the notion of unity of science, uh, if it's understood um, in a bit more... Um, liberal fashion and there's a lot of work actually now coming out that uh, tries to bring this notion back and understand it in a sort of uh, more acceptable way so hopefully we'll get on to some of those reasons that people might um resist unity of science projects because i think a lot of people might have an understand you know think well clearly the sciences you know they're all talking about the same thing they all line up so hopefully we'll make clear what some of those um what some of the arguments for and against are as we go through but firstly then could you just talk to a bit of the history then behind these unity of science projects so you mentioned um logical empiricism or logical positive logical positivism um 
I mean, what were the ideas that were kind of driving some of these programs and how did they fall out of fashion, bringing us to sort of where we're situated today? Yeah, good. It is it is important to sort of see where where this uh, tradition was coming from. Uh, it was very much a reaction in philosophy and philosophy of science in particular against uh, a kind of uh, a looser way of doing science. Now, I'm not an expert on the philosophy uh, uh, of science of the historical period here, but uh, it was pretty clear that uh, there was a search for, for rigor, a new search for rigor, and uh, a sort of a separation of a, of a certain type of uh, way of doing philosophy, really, which, uh, which conceived to be more connected to uh, the empirical sciences in particular. So hence the connection to empiricism. And um, uh, it, it's, it's in this context uh, that uh, the, the idea of a unity of science started to appeal um, attractive to a lot of people. Um, and, uh, you know, people like Carnap in particular, who wanted to um, really criticize uh, this type of uh, metaphysical tradition as well that, uh, that uh, was taking uh, taking hold in uh, continental philosophy earlier in particular. So, so there was a sort of um, uh, appeal to the tools of logic and uh, 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 empirical rigor that uh, was con connected to this, uh, this project in philosophy of science. Um, so really what, what uh, this idea uh, was to, to begin with was that you could use these, uh, these simple rules of, of inference, of deductive reasoning, deductive and nomological uh, explanation um, that uh, is familiar from Hempel's uh, model of deductive uh, nomological explanation, uh, where, where you, could, you, could, you could follow the laws of logic and uh, derive uh, some of these higher level truths, some of the truths of the so-called special sciences from the lower level truths. So ultimately things like fundamental physics. So, so that was the sort of guiding I idea. And uh, this was then uh, connected to uh, work that Ernst Nagel did later in particular, uh, which I think we might, might touch on a little later too. So um, in terms of talking about different ways of looking at unity or disunity, you sort of, um, broadly divide the available models into into two categories so the first of which are ontological models of unity could you sort of introduce what ontological models of unity or disunity might be what what are the available options here and what do we mean by it yeah i i, I think it's important to get this straight at the outset because this is uh, not a traditional distinction that was made i mean it's it's to be derived from the old discussions on unity of science but a lot of it was uh, not really focused on ontology or metaphysics, but rather about our theories, our scientific theories in particular. So when, when people talk about unification, uh, especially now, they often have in mind uh, uh, not an ontological model, but an epistemic or, or theoretical model, uh, which, which I can talk about in a little bit more detail. But my own interests are more on what we might call an ontological model of unity, uh, which, which really is to ask about the real world, about the world of relations, as to what connects the different kinds of entities. So, so there's a very obvious way in which might, we might think that the world, uh, the science, uh, the world that the science studies is unified, which is to say that, uh, well, everything's ultimately made of, uh, of fundamental particles, and these compose uh, larger things, molecules, um, ultimately multicellular organisms, and uh, the conscious lives of us all. So, so there's clearly some sort of a compositional connection going on here. And that would be to say that there's uh, some sort of an ontological connection between these different things as well. Uh, maybe this is uh, what uh, compositional relations are looking at. So higher level things composed of lower level things. So that would be one way to give an ontological model of unity, to just say that, well, things are unified by this uh, compositional uh, dependence or compositional uh, relation. And the models of dis disunity, like ontological models of disunity, what are the kind of um, claims that people who hold to those models are making? Yeah, good. Um, so, so people do talk about the disunity of science now, and I, I guess um, that is uh, a pretty popular way of thinking of this as well. Um, and you could, you could connect this with the notion of pluralism as well, of those pluralism is used in many contexts. But in this context, the disunity or plural, pluralistic framework is uh, um, appealing to some people. I'll, I'll mention just one name. John Dupree has defended this type of view, uh, the philosopher of biology. Um, 
And uh, what people have in mind when they talk about the disunity of sciences here uh, in the ontological sense is that you can't really connect the different sciences by, by looking at one relation like this. So, so there's some ways in which uh, some of the higher level special sciences are independent or autonomous of the lower level. And certainly it would be entailed that you can't derive uh, the higher level truths from the lower level truths in the way that uh, perhaps Nagel and uh, uh, some earlier proponents of the unity of science might have thought. So, so there isn't this sort of a clear explanatory or um, uh, explanatory connection or derivability of uh, the higher level truths from the lower level. Um, now, uh, there are other questions we could ask about this. So, so one thing might be to say that the higher level sciences somehow somehow emerge from the lower level sciences, but they're still dependent on them. But we can touch on that a bit later as well, maybe. Sure. So so you said um, a lot of people might think about this in an epistemic or pragmatic sense. So what, I mean, what is that distinction then? Because the ontological sense, I suppose, seems quite intuitive to think, you know, stuff is just composed of more fundamental stuff and it kind of builds up. So what, what, what would this epistemic and pragmatic uh, way of thinking about things be? Or a model of unity that's epistemic or pragmatic? Yeah. Um, so on the face of it, it might be to say that um, all the sciences, if, if they are unified in, in terms of uh, their epistemic endeavors, they are, they are uh, sort of focused on discovering the same kind of uh, set of set of truths. Um, but in practice, where you see this happening is, is more uh, on what we might call um, a type of theoretical uh, unification. So um, you, you see this happening a lot in, in uh, fundamental physics as well. So it's, it's sort of a unification uh, in, the, uh, in the realm of that one science. So, so you might be looking for a, a, a unified uh, theory of the, the fundamental laws. And that would be a type of uh, an epistemic or pragmatic uh, uh, endeavor as well. So you're trying to explain uh, some uh, some laws in terms of some other laws. And this could happen in one level, or it could happen between the levels as well. So you might be interested in, in explaining uh, some chemical phenomena in terms of uh, uh, quantum mechanics. So look, look at quantum chemistry. So, so that would be a type of unification of, of unifying the, the methods uh, or the practice of um, uh, chemistry uh, with that of physics, uh, to simplify matters a little bit. Um, and, uh, well, th there's pragmatic elements related to, to all of this, of, of course, but uh, you might just uh, think that on a, a very simple way of looking at it pragmatically is that uh, all the sciences share on, in a certain type of scientific method at, at, at the very least. Uh, so, uh, so you could have a, a sort of very weak sense of unity uh, derivable from, from this. Um, and then we could have different kinds of approaches in, uh, in sort of a subspecies of epistemic or pragmatic approach as well. So I think for a lot of people, um, they sort of understand this conception in philosophy of model building, maybe more than more, more than the kind kind of, uh, you know, seeking for necessary and sufficient conditions. When I talk to people who are coming from other disciplines, the, the model building seems to make more sense to them. But mm -hmm. what, what are the kind of data points that we're trying to build a model to fit uh, when it comes to unity of science? So, um, you know, I suppose, I suppose there's like laws and things like that, or the things that the, the kind of entities that the science is uh, investigating. Could, could you speak to what the data is that there is to fit and sort of maybe a little bit of where some models maybe do a bit of a better job at fitting to some of these things or some might do a, a bit of a worse job because there might be these edge cases? Good. Um, now, you mentioned laws, and I think that's probably what uh, almost all all these accounts of unity would, would start with. So we want to we want to give a sense in which uh, the laws of the of the fundamental or more fundamental sciences are, are connected to uh, those of the of the higher level sciences the special sciences and the question would then be well are there any genuine special science laws that aren't um, uh, reducible to the lower level laws so are they in some sense independent of uh, um, of the lower level and uh, that that same question can then be uh, um, asked about other types of, uh, of phenomena as well. So, so you, could, you could ask, are there any higher level properties that are genuinely not uh, reducible to the lower level properties? Or are there any higher level natural kinds 
that aren't uh, reducible to lower and natural kinds. Now, when I say natural kind, I'll, I'll just add that often people talk about it uh, in, in, in the sense that almost anything could, could, could count as a kind. So, so gold is a classic example. Water is another classic example. But uh, Fodor, for instance, talks about uh, money as a natural kind. So uh, that would be a higher level kind. Uh, and a lot of people might uh, question whether it's a, it's a natural kind, whether it's independent of our own interests and activities in the sort of sufficiently objective way. So, so Fodor would argue that something like natural kind uh, something like uh, money is a is a high level uh, natural kind, and it has genuine laws governing it. So he mentions uh, a law of economics, Gresham's law, that governs uh, economical uh, uh, activities, and uh, these would be the sort of main data points that we would be looking at, uh, I guess, whether there would be uh, truly independent high level uh, laws, properties, kinds, uh, really whatever you're interested in. And in terms of some of the main um, difficulties for unity, you know, our arguments in favor of disunity are going to maybe focus on presumably um, psychological phenomena, maybe, because it, it, it seems more difficult to, to reduce those. Is that is that the general trend or uh, where where do the interfaces seem to line up a bit better as well between the sciences? Yeah, good. Um, so. Uh, you're absolutely right to say that consciousness would be would be a good would be a good target here. So, so this is, uh, I guess, one of the traditional reasons why someone would resist uh, the unity of science thesis. So, so Fodor has a couple of famous papers on this, uh, uh, and he's clearly, I mean, he mentions things like money, but he's clearly interested m mainly in in conscious phenomena or uh, things like uh, pain, the experience of pain and uh, other mental states or belief states, things like this. So, so a, a lot of people who resist uh, or argue against the sort of classic unity of science thesis would, would want to uphold uh, mental states as, as an irreducible or emergent or genuine higher level uh, feature. But uh, uh, that's not all. Uh, th there are people who defend, for instance, the independence of of chemistry over physics. So, so Robin Henry, a, a good friend of mine up in up in Durham, has defended that chemistry is strongly emergent, so not reducible to uh, to physics. Now, this is controversial, but um, that's that's just to say that there are people who defend this. Um, similarly, in biology, or uh, things like uh, evolutionary explanation uh, or uh, the biological function of certain kinds of uh, uh, things like like proteins for instance uh people have uh, held and still argue um in favor of their um independence from the from the lower level uh, goings on in in one way or another so uh where, i guess i mean you asked about the success of these different models as well so just to very briefly answer that i guess that there's been much more success in uh, in reducing or explaining uh for instance, chemical phenomena in terms of the, the underlying physics, uh, which isn't really surprising because the more complexity you build in, you know, you go to biology, you go to psychology, um, the more the more variables there are to consider, and uh, the, the the less mature the science is in in, in some ways to uh, to answer these questions. How how uh, um, how might uh, consciousness be related to the underlying neurochemistry. Well, people are studying this, but uh, if you wanted to defend a, a strong form of uh, unity of science, uh, you uh, you might think that uh, that the science isn't mature enough to answer these questions. So, something I was just thinking um, as well that could be a good part of this question is, in terms of comparing models, I mean, how does that discussion look in the unity of science space? Because it presumably it, it seems like it might be easier to deny that um something that should be a data point is a legitimate data point that a model has to account for you know someone might say well this is a natural kind and you might say well my model doesn't you know doesn't account for that but that's because so i don't think that's a natural kind kind of thing um and then it beca it becomes more difficult to focus solely on the sort of um virtues of the different models that people are building um i mean Typically, how how do people pick between models? Is is it just looking at the virtues? Is is there any kind of principled 
set of reasons that people can appeal to for um, saying, you know, that ha this has to be a natural kind or this isn't, you know, I'm going to resist it because I'm more I'm more committed to my model being the right one than I am to, you know, that thing being a natural kind or whatever. Wow, that I mean, that's a good question. Sorry, there's a I lot think... in there. <laughs> yeah, it might be a bit. Unfair. No, no, that's a very good question. But it's I think it's also a very difficult one to answer because um, you'll find that people are very um, trenched in their in their sort of pos positions. So so I, I, I mean, there, there isn't as much of, of changing from one model or opinion to another as you as you might maybe hope. Um, now, uh, that's not to say that there aren't, you know, data points that we can agree on and that we could convert people to uh, another position. And of course, I like to think that all of this is uh, continues with the with the empirical sciences. Uh, so I think that we can get data points from the empirical sciences that convert us to to uh, uh, you know believe that something is uh, is reducible or, or or indeed isn't reducible. Now, having said that, I think it's much easier to get evidence for the reducibility of something than it is to get evidence for the irreducibility of something because uh, you never really know what the future science is going to tell you about this. Now, but from the history of science, we can get good examples. You know. Uh, People thought for a long time that uh, uh, vitalism, the doctrine of vitalism, is uh, is sort of a higher level science in its own um, own right. So there's there's a, a vital force that explains, uh, you know, something about living organisms. Uh, we don't have to go into the details, but uh, it suffices to say that uh, that biology has has replaced a lot of the um, the notions that were used in in that uh, tradition of vitalism. Um, and I mean, the same thing could could uh, could happen uh, elsewhere. Um, uh, to mention just one other thing, I think an important factor in, in deciding whether something is supposed to count as a natural kind or not is uh, uh, um, what what is called um, projectability in in this in this debate. So this is uh, just to use a bit, a bit of a simplicity, a, sim a simple way of thinking this is uh, the ability for us to uh, uh, predict. Um, and uh, well, explain um, patterns in data. So uh, typically, you, you'd say that uh, this type of projectability is a sign of uh, of causal influence. And uh, if you think that causation is a genuine phenomenon, then you might think that this is uh, what latches you on to what's happening in the real world. So if if a if a postulated higher level kind or property is causally influential. Uh, then it could be deemed real. Now, this is going back to some popular doctrines in history of philosophy as well. Uh, now, the problem with this, uh, very briefly, is that uh, often it's difficult to say what exactly is having the causal influence. So, whether we could explain the causal influence in in uh, some other ways. Oh, that's your next question. This is perfect. Well, I thought, perfect. I thought, yeah, I thought I'd pop it up because if it, if it's come up, I want I want people just to be able to kind of see uh, the the questions underneath as we go. So, is there a sort of um, convenient example of this projectability then that that you could give for people just to sort of um, flesh that out a bit more? Yeah, I mean. You could you could really think of any kind of uh, uh, any kind of law of of, of nature. Um, uh, they they would they would give us these sort of tools to project. Um, so um, let me take one that Hempel uses: all gases expand when heated under constant pressure. So uh, uh, something something like this would would give us uh, uh, reasons to think that we can we can make a universal generalization. And there's there's some sort of law-like explanation involved, and when there is this type of uh, law-like explanation going on, um, then we can make predictions about the future behavior of those uh, of those gases. You know, something like the ideal gas law. Um, now, uh, maybe it's. I wonder uh, if it's good to Im Im imagine a, a problematic case as well at this point. So. Well, we might return to this. So, so I'm thinking of the debate that Fodor and Kim had later on about these sort of cases. Um, but yeah, so so I think it's it's good to think of this idea of, of projectability just as a, as an ability to make predictions which are somehow cause, uh, uh, tied to the causal uh, uh, background. And could you speak to the sense in which pe people often say natural kinds carve nature at the joints? 
Um, and I think, I think for for modern people, it's sort of difficult to understand what that might mean. Um, I think maybe that makes more sense in a kind of Aristotelian or Platonic framework. And I don't I don't mean to be dogmatic and just sort of rule those out. Um, but I think most people sort of find find the idea of things having kind of like essences or something a bit sort of spooky or something. But so so in a in a more kind of naturalistic framework, what what does a natural kind mean? And then maybe you could talk about you know if there are contemporary versions of Aristotelianism or Platonism that seem you know more plausible as well for for providing natural kinds. Good, yeah, I'd be using the notion of natural kind a little bit already here, of course. Um, uh, but my my own view of it is sort of traditional, so I'm uh, I'm uh, sympathetic to a type of uh, uh, Aristotelian view about natural kinds. Well, what we might think is Aristotelian view about natural kinds, um, but th the notion is used very liberally nowadays. So so I think it's helpful to distinguish between what we might call natural kind terms or just kind terms and what are supposedly genuine natural kinds. So we used. Uh, kind terms, you know, we talk about cars and pencils and uh, all sorts of things, artifacts that we've we've created. Now, uh, most people would agree that at least these aren't natural in the in the intended sense because we've created them. So sometimes you, you might appeal appeal to uh, uh, mind independence when you're talking about this with that natural kinds carve at nature at its joints. So you might think that a, a genuine natural kind has to be somehow independent of our of our activities or interests in in, in this sort of way um so the, well, the you, other part of the oh sorry you I, I was gonna say the other part of the question was sort of like so what i mean what's the sense in which these things sort of genuinely carve nature at its joints so to speak which is what you often hear people say who talk about natural kinds yeah well i mean that's uh, again that's a good question um but very difficult. So, so, so I mean, the joint carving analogy goes back to Plato. Uh, so, so it has a it has a venerable history. But people use it in all sorts of ways nowadays. Um, but I, I think that the uh, the core is there uh, that is supposed to be there uh, is is just the idea that there is a level of objectivity or or indeed mind independence, which is difficult to specify. I should say the mind independence of a natural kind as well. I have a paper on this. Uh, that hopefully I can cite at some point. Um, so, um, uh, I, I mean, not to go, not to get too bogged down with the with this notion of joint carving itself. It, it it's supposed to be something that is is worldly. It's out there. It's not just a, a, our decision. You know, I, we can decide that something is a, is a, is a kind, and this is what we would do with artifactual kinds all the time, right? So uh, we we say that there's something in common with all of these. Uh, of these pencils well what's what's in common with them well you can write with them well that's a function so that would be a functional kind but i think that not all functional kinds certainly are natural kinds in the intended sense because there's nothing uh the world doesn't as it were do anything uh to uh, make pencils homogeneous in this way it's a, our decision that well anything that you can write with is a pencil or is a is a uh, writing tool pen whatever same goes with chairs or tables or what have you. And in <clears throat> in terms of, yeah, it, it it definitely does help. But the the next thing that comes up is sort of like how how it is that we can tell the difference then between you know these artificial kinds and genuine natural kinds. Because I mean I mean you talked a little bit about projectability when I when I popped this question up, but it it sort of seems to me I don't know like there are plausible candidates maybe for. Um, projectable things that pens can do you know like okay if, if it's a pen it will be able to do x y and z or something like that and um mm -hmm. you, but but i don't want to say that pens are genuine natural kinds you know in the same sense that maybe like um muons or electrons or something are so um i mean how how can we tell the difference between genuine natural kinds or sort of art artificial ones yeah good i think that's a that's a key key question really in in this debate and i mean there are many uh, many potential answers to it <clears throat> but uh, one of us is one of them is certainly tied to this idea of of uh, projectability or causal influence uh, so uh, for instance um, uh, uh, muhammad ali khalidi has a has a nice nice book on this uh, i think i even have it here uh, natural categories and human kinds where he defends this type of view where uh, it's really natural kinds are 
the causal nexus of uh, of the world so so this is where causal influence uh, uh meets in in some way um but i i think we can we can take a step back because this type of question comes up already in this in this debate between kim and Fodor that i mentioned uh okay. briefly maybe maybe now is a good time to mention an example yeah. from there because so um, if you if you want to just maybe if we would it be better to segue through um the Nagalian model to Kim and Fodor and talk about the Jade and Nephrite stuff, or do you want to talk? I, I don't mean to interrupt your train of thought. If you if you've got a good example in your mind now, yeah, I'm I'm tempted to introduce this example from from Kim because yeah, I free. think it illustrates this quite nicely, and we can then see if we return to this. So yeah. so this is this is not going to take too long necessarily because um, the the idea is very simple. Uh, it's that uh, Kim Kim uh, mentioned this case of Jade uh, that that you just said. Uh, where jade is being uh, is being realized or reduced to jadeite or nephrite. So so jade is a mineral kind, but it turns out there's two different types, jadeite and nephrite, and they're all called jade. And uh, what what uh, what Kim proposed is that well, this is uh, this is a case where we have uh, a supposed special science law. We can say jade is green, and we can make generalizations from that, but uh, it doesn't seem that, uh, according to Kim, that it, it, it captures the right type of in influence, um, the type of that we were just just searching for. Because really, what you're being what you're saying when you say jade is green, what what you're really saying is is either jadeite is green or nephrite is green, depending on your your instance of jade at at hand. You know, you might you might have a piece. Uh, always when I talk about this, I wish I had a jade artifact as a prop, but they're quite expensive. Uh, <laughs> when you have a piece of jade in your hand, you say, well, jade is green or tis, this piece of jade is green. Uh, what you're really saying is jade is green or nephrite is green. I, I mean, the example is stupid because jade comes in many colors anyway, but uh, <laughs> let's okay. let's leave that to one side. Kim, yeah. Kim didn't seem to realize that. <laughs> um, but the point is then that we uh, what we have there is not a genuine natural kind, according to, to Kim, really, uh, even though um, it, it looks projectable uh, at, at the outset. Uh, but what's what's not uh, projectable there, according to Kim, is is, uh, is is Jade. Jade isn't projectable. Jade isn't the, the, the one that has the causal influence. It's either one of these realizers, Jadeite or Nephrite. So what we, we should be looking at is the lower level rather than the higher level law. So so that's, that's supposed to be a case that illustrates to us uh, how we can tell uh, uh, genuine kinds from from non-genuine kinds. Now, I'm not saying that this right. is uh, an example that works all the way through, but uh, but I think it's a simple illustration of this. And then Kim and Fodor had this classic debate about this case. So that might be a more natural way then of segueing into um, some of the a, a few of the different I, ways of breaking down reduction that you talk about in the book. So the first one is this Nagalian model of reduction, and not. Um, Thomas Nagel, who everyone knows, but Ernest Nagel, um, and what what is this uh, idea of reduction then? Yeah, good. We've we've sort of touched on this a little bit, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But uh, um, I mentioned briefly this idea of um, I think a deductive nomological model of explanation earlier. Now that's not Nagel's model, but it's it's Hempel's, but it's very closely related to the Nagelian model of reduction. So. Uh, the deductive nomological model is is just very briefly um, uh, that there's uh, there's an explanandin and an explanans. So the explanandin would be a sentence describes a certain phenomenon we want to explain, and then there's the explanans, which is some class of sentences that provides the explanation for the phenomenon. And uh, uh, then the deductive part of this model would be uh, the requirement that uh, the explanandin has to follow from the explanans by logical consequence. So this is this is the Hempelian model of deductive nomological explanation, uh, and uh, the nomological part comes from something I already mentioned, which is that all gases expand when heated under constant pressure, and this is what we would would be regarded as a law in this type of explanation. So we could use that law and the fact that a given sample of a gas has been heated under constant pressure and explain why the sample of gas has expanded. So this is really like a very simple model of explanation, if you if you like. But uh, the Nagelian reduction takes this as a starting point, which is, um, I think I 
actually I'm, i've got my book open here i've i've got a nice passage from nigel himself here on this maybe i just read this okay. out so you you can share your screen as well i think if you want but don't worry if uh, oh this is very brief has... I'll, I'll just say yeah. i'll just say this one one thing uh, he says that a reduction is affected when the experimental laws of the secondary science are shown to be the logical consequences of the theoretical assumptions of the primary science. That's it. So by logical consequence, you're supposed to derive uh, you know, a connection between the laws of two sciences, as it were, or, or two phenomena, if you like. So uh, the basic form would, would just be that a theory call it a, a, the A theory, it reduces to a theory B uh, if and only if uh, you can derive uh, A from B with the help of some, uh, uh, well, uh, they could call some coordinating definitions, but uh, that more commonly known as bridge laws about the principle. So so you have you have two theories and then you have these, these laws that supposedly connect them, bridge laws. Uh, and uh, if you have those in place, then you can derive the other theory from the other one by logical consequence. So this is a very strong way of, of moving about it. And, you know, no one would argue at this time that we could derive uh, mental states just from some neuroscientific data. But, of course, they might say, well, we don't have the bridge laws that connect the neural states and the mental phenomena yet. Right. So this is this is a very simplified way of looking at negative and real action, but it's it is a quite simplified uh, picture. So um, in sort of tracking the progress that the dialectic makes, you know, over the past um, fifty or however many years that this is taking place, what is Fodor's multiple realization objection then to these kinds of unity projects? Yeah, good. I've uh, I've sort of. Uh, uh, predicted some of these these issues already in what I've said before, but now now we can kind of close the circle because uh, the case of Jade, of course, is uh, is something that Kim claims claims is a case of multiple realization. But it, at its simple level, let's let's start with with the case of pain, right? So multiple realization is just the idea that the same higher level phenomenon such as pain can be realized by multiple different lower level phenomena. So um, take uh, take human pain and uh, uh, well, octopus you can pain. Take <laughs> octopus pain. That's the <laughs> classic example. I mean, uh, just uh, well, let's keep it simple. Yes, take human pain and octopus, octopus pain. This is supposed to be, of course, the same higher level phenomenon in this case, but that can be realized by two different kind of uh, neurophysiological processes: the one in humans and the one in octopus. Um, so uh, the th the thought is just that you you can you can find uh, uh, a higher level phenomenon uh, a natural kind if you like uh, and uh, you can find multiple different bases from it uh, for from the lower level and that already blocks the sort of simple identification of the higher level and the lower level stuff so you can't just say that pain is uh, neurophysiological stuff of kind A because it turns out that there's stuff kind B which also brings forward or uh, causes, if you like, the same type of higher level phenomenon. So this is uh, like a very simple way of looking at it, of course, but um, that's supposed to block this type of old uh, idea of unity of science as well, because uh, um, you can't just uh, proceed by logical consequence from one to the other if, if there's these multiple paths that you'd, you're supposed to follow. You really, really need identity uh, to be able to follow this. Uh, this through. So in, in terms of um, what's most popular for blocking unity projects, I mean, is this still sort of the main kind of boogeyman, as it were, or are there other, I mean, obviously there are other arguments, but are there other sort of more popular, that are seen as more forceful uh, reasons to kind of reject unity now? Yeah, I, I, I would still say that uh, the multiple objection in its various forms, and I mean, it has been uh, discussed a lot after Fodor as well, uh, but I, I'd still say that that's the main reason. Uh, you know, if you if you if you were to ask philosophers of science now, why why would why don't you accept uh, you know uh, theoretical reduction, ident identity reduction? They would probably cite most of them would probably cite uh, multiplicalization uh, objections or arguments. Um, so I think that it's still the main uh, main reason to go here. Um, I mean, there are others though. Uh, so. 
a lot of people might say, and rightly so, that just the, the old fashioned model of multiple realization is, is itself too simplistic. So some people would just deny this type of levels thinking altogether because the old view of unity of science is, is built on there being these hierarchical levels that are very strictly connected. So uh, a lot of people would say maybe that um, th the truth is much more messy, you know, there's all sorts of interlevel connections and there's cross-cutting kinds uh, and all sorts of things that um, prevent even maybe even more seriously than the multipolarization prevent this type of uh, reductive ac activity. So uh, these are, I mean, in some ways I'd, I'd say that these are just more fine-grained versions of a, a type of multipolarization objection, but uh, uh, the classic one is, is still forceful for, for many. So I've got a couple more questions for you, and then we will move on to Q&A. So mm -hmm. just people who are watching in the chat, if they want to put those questions now, and then we'll have them to come to in a moment. Um, but we talked a lot about, about sort of um, ideas of reduction, but what are emergentist models of unity? And how do emergentist models differ from reductive models? So how, how do emergentists sort of cash out what emergence means and things like that? Yeah, good. This is obviously a, a really big topic, but uh, but just to connect it to uh, what we've been discussing, I've, I've, I've mentioned emergence a couple of times in passing here. And uh, uh, there's really, we should, at the outset, distinguish between weak and strong emergence. So, so emergence uh, altogether is just the idea that there's some sort of autonomy of a higher level uh, science or, or, or kind or what have you. And uh, it's, it's, it depends from the lower level uh, that's a part of uh, the emergentist model. It depends on the lower level, but it has a level of autonomy. Now, there are many different ways to cash out what that autonomy is supposed to amount to, but uh, a good way or kind of a popular way is to say that there's some sort of new causal power or influence, which connects it back to what we've been talking about. So um, uh, kind of a weak emergentist picture, which is very popular, it, it can be uh, a fairly weak view, as the name suggests, is just that uh, there's some sort of uh, surprising or or novel feature that comes about in in scientific discourse, for instance, and we, we could say that it's it's weakly emergent from from uh, what's what's happened before, even though we we kind of see how it's connected to the lower levels. So um, uh, so weak emergence isn't necessarily a, a particularly problematic view for the unity of science. I think. Uh, at least if it's understood relatively weakly, you can very easily connect it with this type of idea. But uh, the idea or possibility of strong emergence is uh, more serious because uh, that is the idea that whatever new powers or kinds come about, they are they are totally novel. So they are not present in any format in the lower level, and we can't necessarily derive them from the lower level either. So Again, consciousness is, is often mentioned as a potential example, but as I noted, uh, some people might think that uh, some of the other sciences as well have this element of strong emergence, like Robin Hendry defense in the case of, uh, of chemistry. Um, so uh, maybe I won't try to give a, a more comprehensive introduction to emergence because there are very many different approaches to it. But um, th just the implication for, for the unity, uh, the way I understand it is that weak emergence wouldn't be a problem for the type of ontological unity that uh, that I've uh, I've defended but strong emergence uh, potentially would be there's obviously so much to each of these topics you know that that can't really just be covered in in about an hour or so but I think you do a good job in terms in terms of um covering this a bit of the giving uh, an impression of some of the breadth and depth to some of these things um so the the last question then that I've got here is what do you view as some of the most promising research programs in the unity of science? So, I mean, this could be in terms of making progress to show, you know, clear cases of ontological reduction or reduction of different kinds that haven't been shown before, or clear cases of disunity. I mean, where, where does it look like we're kind of heading in your view? Yeah, good. Uh, I mean, all of the things you mentioned would be, would be relevant. So, I, I guess I would start by saying that uh, the promising research in this area isn't necessarily done under the label of a unity of science. And that's partially because it still has this baggage from the old, uh, uh, you know, uh, Nagelian reductive models, which are not, not very popular now. So I, I think that the most promising work is, is done on, a, on a case studies, really. Uh, 
So uh, details, case studies from the sciences that try to uh, look at the connections between, uh, let's say, uh, uh, proteins and their chemical basis. You know, this is stuff that I've been interested in myself. Uh, biochemical kinds, uh, kinds that uh, natural kinds that seem to overlap uh, to sort of scientific boundaries, if you like. Of course, science isn't actually layered that sharply anyway. But those sort of case studies can help us to understand well what it is that connects these types of kinds and these types of disciplines or phenomena into each other. So looking at those relations that uh, supposedly, um, well, I mean, they look a little bit like the old bridge laws, but I, I don't think they should be called bridge laws because uh, uh, they could be as simple as, as compositional relations or um, uh, even dependence relations at the same level. So, so you might be looking at uh, these sort of things just in, in foundational uh, physics as well. So I think those, those would be the, the best examples. Um, I'm interested in seeing what kind of new work is, is being done on the notion of reduction itself, because that also has a bit of a bad name from the, from the history. But I think people are now starting to realize that uh, we can distinguish between what, what I'm calling ontological reduction in these ontological models of science and semantic reduction or semantic eliminativism. So, so you might think that the higher level sciences are perfectly entitled to their language of higher level language. So we can still talk about love at the end of the day, even if it were to be ontologically reducible to some uh, uh, lower level uh, uh, goings on. And, and just briefly, being a, um, a, a pro, uh, being an advocate of unity yourself, what do you think is sort of the the, the strongest um, element for concern for your position? You know, what, is, is there anything that you look at and you sort of think, oh no, you know, that looks quite promising in, in, in the disunity camp, as it were? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, I'm not too worried about any of this because I, I'm willing to kind of go where the, the data uh, shows, despite mentioning the trenched positions before, yeah. entrenched positions before. But um, I guess I would be, uh, I, I think that where I, where I would need to do more work to understand how uh, the model of unity that I, I prefer works is in the, in the realm of... Uh, uh, process ontology, the type of uh, uh, process views in, in biology, for instance, defended by, by Chun Dupri, who I mentioned before, who are strong proponents of, of disunity. And one of the reason is that, reasons is that you have to understand life according to this sort of, of biological phenomenon, according to this view, as a, as a type of process. And uh, I haven't quite made up my, my mind about what's the best way to approach those questions uh, in, in the ontological context that I'm working with. So, so the sort of dynamical aspects of these uh, of these phenomena as well uh, are are uh, uh, you know difficult questions. So, if we go over to the audience Q and A now, then um, there was a question a little bit earlier, and I'm not sure if I'll be able to find it. Um... That I wanted to get back to, it was asking though. I can remember what the question was, and maybe you could begin answering it, and I'll see if I can find it. But it was, um, what is natural? So when we're talking about natural kinds, for example, I mean, what what do we mean by natural um, when we're talking in this speaking in this context? That's actually a great a great question, and a, and again, a, as great questions often are very difficult to answer comprehensively. Um, so a lot of people. Um, a lot of people, when they when they talk about natural kinds or natural properties in this context, have a pretty specific meaning in mind that comes from David Lewis's work on natural properties. But that's notoriously difficult to understand as well. So uh, the thought would be that that there could be some uh, perfectly natural properties in the world. Good candidates would be those of, that come from fundamental physics, like like charge. So uh, maybe the best way to approach this is to, to take an example like charge, the property of charge. It doesn't seem like there's any uh, other sort of lower level um, stuff that we could we could uh, reduce it to. Um, now, uh, th the tricky thing here is, is that uh, a lot of the things that we might say are candidates for natural kinds are not natural in this sense at all. I mean, uh, if, they're, if they're things like pain states or or uh, even the case of uh, of some chemical kinds, 
um, there, there's a, a certain level of of, uh, of messiness involved uh, that I mentioned before. So, uh, I guess just just to give an like an intuitive idea of of this, uh, you, you could say that at least we can say clear cases of what aren't natural properties are things like uh, famous example from Nelson Goodman, GRU. So. Uh, this is this is the sort of weird combination of green and blue, uh, where emeralds are are green at 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 one moment of time and uh, turn or could turn to be blue at a later moment of time. Um, so so a strange sort of hybrid property. Um, so uh, this type of artificial property would be a good example of what's definitely not natural uh, according to this line of thinking. But the, the tricky thing here, and this goes back to what you asked about uh, natural kinds itself, the tricky thing is uh, knowing exactly where the border is supposed to go and what the correct criterion is. So people would try to ap appeal to causation, but personally, I don't think that that's going to quite cut, cut the or do the job. Is, is there any notion... Um, of sort of intersubjective testability is something that goes into natural here. So, you know, say if we could, if we could reliably, um, I don't know, hold a seance and summon a demon or something, <laughs> you know, like what would then demons be natural kinds that would have to be, you know, considered natural? Or is that sort of, you know, that's something that's not natural. It's pushed out into the supernatural by virtue of it not being, I, I don't know, would it, it, it's not causal in the same way as other stuff is or... It, yeah how do you kind of think about that sort of stuff no good yeah i i mean i guess so most people who talk about these sort of natural properties or uh, would would definitely want to rule out those cases um so so one way to look at this and i, I mean i don't think this quite works either but but jonathan schaffer has has uh defended this type of a scientific view of natural properties or sparse properties as they're sometimes called as well and that could work in this context as well which is just say that well if they're mentioned in the sciences in the natural sciences then then they're natural i mean obviously this is problematic because what counts as a science here in the first place but so, so i think a lot of people would want to rule out those those cases uh, that, that you mentioned that might touch on the supernatural as it were so there's definitely a type of physicalist or naturalist doctrine uh, on on the background here as well um so another question from ben then um do you think that the hierarchy of the sciences may be motivated through a real pattern relation transitive obtaining between the models of the theories uh, can also distinguish kinds of models and then he he did put between more theoretical and predictive models i think good yeah um so uh, I'm I'm trying to see whether this refers to the uh, the the Dinettian notion of real patterns. Uh, if that's if that's I think it, I think that's where that behind, yeah. terminology is coming from. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's right. So uh, now this is something we've discussed actually in 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 my research group a, a lot. So so uh, one of the former postdocs, Vanessa Seifert, has worked a lot on on looking at uh, real patterns in this context. And I think that the cautious answer is that yes, you could you could develop a um, type of a hierarchical model out of this, uh, which would be a type of unity. I mean, how strict the hierarchy is going to be is is an open question here. But so, for instance, Vanessa has a paper arguing that the chemical bond could be understood as a real pattern, and if that's the case, then that gives us a sort of uh, way to approach this type of uh, hierarchy of the sciences via via def real patterns and i mean is it going to be transitive i'm i'm not sure maybe it has to be if it's going to be a strict hierarchy so so th there are definitely open questions there i'm i'm uh, a little bit uncertain myself about whether the real patterns uh, approach is going to do the trick here but that's uh, I should have really mentioned it as one of these areas that people are looking at uh, with regard to unity. So it is a, it is a question on point, definitely. Uh, taking back Eden, thank you for your super chat, asks, um, do you have any thoughts on major paradigm changes to the status quo in metaphysics uh, now uh, in the future or the major changes that took place in the past? Uh, thanks for your consideration. I suppose it's it's quite um, broad, maybe, maybe to... Um, make it a bit more precise would be you know what what you think it is that do you have any ideas about what it is that underpins those changes or prompt prompt 
expect them to happen? I mean, is it is it the old sci- the old scientists dying off and new ones taking their place or something else? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think there there is an interesting question here for sure. But yeah, th- there are different ways that one could approach this. Um, uh, just to take take a couple, one of them, I suppose that, um, well, I mean, I, I might as well uh, cite cite my my colleague here in Bristol, James Lederman, who's of course uh, tried to uh, get a type of paradigm change going on in 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 uh, his very influential book, Everything Must Go. Right. So so that that is supposed to be a paradigm change in metaphysics, and I think that there has been actually a type of paradigm change. Uh, I mean, paradigm change is a very strong word. I, I don't mean in the Kuhnian sense necessarily, but uh, so so. This would be an example where uh, supposedly the, the science, looking at the latest science in detail, uh, informs us uh, about what kind of questions are okay to ask in metaphysics. So, so uh, the, the thought is that the science somehow constrains uh, the metaphysics. Now, the attempted reading there, I think, is is too strong. That's in the in the old "Everything Must Go" book. But from my many conversations with James, I can say that he's more amenable to to metaphysics than it might seem from that that introduction. Um, but I think that that makes it for a good example of, of a, what it could look like, what that kind of paradigm change could look like if we sort of give up some of these uh, um, um, more cocooned uh, uh, pursuits uh, in metaphysics and, and engage with the sciences a bit more. Uh, but I think that there's a place for very abstract metaphysics anyway. So, so I'm not saying that this is necessarily happened in this sort of way but uh, just to give an example of what it could look like the, the next question i'm not going to attempt to say that thing at the start that's a trap um, but how do you view the mathematical platonism uh, slash nominalism debate with respect to the unity of science um and then we maybe you can move on to the bonus question after if you want to answer that one first that's yeah that's a good question uh tervesia takaisin tampereelle this is in finnish so <laughs> right is, okay uh... <laughs> This is a Finnish viewer, uh, I expect. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is a good question. It's a, it's a question I'm interested in. Uh, I don't think that it's going to um, have as direct a bearing on the unity of science question as you as you might think. Now, of course, if you are a, a Platonist about mathematics, if you think that there's a sort of Platonic heaven with, with numbers, uh, then it doesn't seem that it's nicely... Uh, unified with the with the natural sciences, if you like. Um, so, so I would I would just venture to say that at the at the outset, a, a type of nominalist approach might be uh, a little bit um, more amenable to this type of thinking. But I don't think it really settles the the question because uh, none of these old views about the unity of science were supposed to be claims about mathematics specifically. Mathematics has always had a little life of its own in some some sense here. Um, now, I, I'll, I'll very briefly answer the bonus question. I, I'm not convinced by the indispensability arguments for Platonism or the enhanced indispensability arguments for Platonism. Um, uh, it's not my area of expertise, really, but I'm very sympathetic to work done by uh, another Finnish person, Juha Saatsi uh, at Leeds. He's written a couple of good papers on this. Uh, and another colleague of mine here uh, in Bristol, Rob Knowles, they've got a paper together on this. So, so I'd recommend that that uh on on this topic uh so the next question it might need a bit of passing i think i, I think there's about two or three more questions by the way if um you're okay for time yeah but, that's okay so this one is can you speak about the unity and differences of sciences in aristotle and the aristotelian view of science i'm not so I, so i guess he means a more like historical interpretation of the aristotelian view of science and how unity fits into that yeah, I'm, I, I hesitate to s- sort of make any strong claims here because uh, I, I feel like uh, I might be stepping on the on the toes of my uh, colleagues who actually are experts on on, on Aristotle, uh, wh- wh- whose work I respect immensely. So so I always think that Aristotle is so so rich uh, that it's difficult to say, uh, you know, what the correct interpretation is there. So it, as far as exe- exegesis goes, I, I try to steer clear. But having said that, um, my view of, of Aristotle is that it's it's very uh, very conducive to to what uh, I've been talking about as the ontological idea of, of unity. Uh, and uh, 
I'll say why, because I, I regard Aristotle as a sort of uh, uh, naturalistic philosopher, whatever that means. Uh, naturalism is, is, a, is a notorious word here, but, but uh, there, there's some evidence that he did actually engage in, in some scientific experimentation, very limited ones. And we all know that he had some pretty controversial views as well, which were supposedly justified by 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 science. So, you know, take this all with a with a uh, with a pinch of salt. Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering the spirit of the question very well, but I'll, I'll just say that uh, it, it seems that the Aristotelian model of doing metaphysics and indeed philosophy is very much in continuity with this type of uh, ontological unity of science view, as I understand it. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I, th I think that I think that's a good go at it. I do. I you know the those historical questions are so plagued with um, <laughs> you know that's, that's like a whole sub discipline in and of itself, right? Uh, interpreting these guys and stuff. Um, so Deepak has asked, is this mm -hmm. a good definition of uh, nat prop? I'm not sure. Natural uh, property, perhaps. Yeah, maybe. Um, predicates that can lead to representations that lead to inductive biases that have maximal predictive power. Yeah, I think natural property makes sense with it being predicates. But, uh, yeah, I, I, ex I expect that that's what's being meant here uh, based on what we've discussed as well. Now. So I'll, I'll just have to read this again to think this through. So yeah, no problem. Yeah, I mean, I think that the the thought that sort of underlies here does come close to a way that some people would understand natural properties. Um, so, I, I mean, inductive biases, I, I mean, I just, uh, I, I'm not sure what, what, what to read into that part of the question. But um, so insofar as... Um, as the underlying uh, basis of our ability to predict uh, things uh, in, in science and and uh, and elsewhere is based on on something like um, causal powers, and and these are captured by uh, the natural properties, then um, then this this would uh, this would be a way to to, to track it now. I mean, I wouldn't myself be uh, sympathetic to defining natural properties in this way, if only because I don't think that they they should be predicates. So, so this this would be a, sort of a semantic uh, approach to them. But uh, now, the, the predicates that we use in the science or in representations that have this maximal predictive power, now they could they could uh, uh, they could be an isomorphism, or they could be some sort of a, a mapping of those predicates to to natural properties. Now. I don't think that all of them would necessarily uh, be so mapped to genuine natural properties. This this would be, I think, uh, a mistake. John Heil put it well in somewhere: a mistake of sort of trying to read off the metaphysical features of the world from the sciences, from the predicates of the sciences. So I'd be a little cautious here, but there's definitely something in the background here that is readable into some of the contemporary work on natural properties. So so I think that there's there's a there's a, a proper genuine thought behind here. I think he's saying in the chat the reason that he asked that is something oh. to do with his, his job as a software engineer um, working in machine learning. So something to do with no free lunch theorem of machine learning. Um, I don't know if you, oh, there's anything further that you want to say about that or there's a uh, last question we can move on to and then wrap things up. I, I'm not sure what the uh, uh, what the connection sure is either, machine sorry. learning there. So, so yeah, I can't help. I'll skip that. Um, so his second question was, what does uh, Thomas think about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences? So I think this is the Eugene Wigner um, quote that it's what we, uh, a miracle which we neither deserve nor um, something else, that, that, that mathematics is so effective. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I, I mean, I guess... Uh, the sort of obvious thought might be related to an earlier question, which is the uh, indispensability argument or enhanced indispensability argument for for uh, for Platonism. So, uh, I mean, other than that, I don't really have um, have any sort of well conceived thoughts on this. Uh, I, I guess I would just say that um, uh, this uh, there's. Well, let's put it this way. There's there's something that needs to be explained, which this quote captures. 
and that uh, issue is is taking up in, now in the Platonism nominalism debate. I I think to an extent at least. So um, uh, so we must explain what gives mathematics its explanatory power. So uh, and and one way to put this is 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 there generally mathematical explanation that's distinct from uh, physical explanation, as it were, or causal explanation. Now, I think, citing Sartre again, that there, there, there might not be uh, any sort of uh, genuinely uh, mathematical explanation that supports Platonism. And, uh, and that, that would be my sort of uh, train of thought from, from the quote, if that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Uh, so, so actually, I did say that was the last question, but um, Johnson Pike has just put in a super chat, so thank you for that. He asks, uh, "What's Taco's opinion on mathematical ontic structural realism, if you have one?" Yeah, well, again, this is obviously closely related to to my colleague James Ladyman's uh, work, who's who's uh, uh, the best known defender probably of, of ontic structural realism. I'm, I mean, mat uh, mathematical. Uh, Mathematical structuralism is a slightly different, uh, uh, different project. Uh, but let me let me just let me just address this uh, on a very general level because we don't really have time to go into the details of the various kinds of structuralisms. Um, I, I'd, I'd say that um, I'm puzzled by uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the sort of um, consequences of this type of framework, which is to say that there's there's supposed to be um, relations without without relata, if if you if you uh, if you allow this this kind of an obscure usage. So so if we're supposed to uh, eliminate the objects that are related by these by these structural relations, um, then at least in that format, uh, the various kinds of structural views are are too strong for me to swallow. Now James doesn't necessarily defend this lady man that is uh, in in its strongest form but Stephen French has argued in favor of this for instance so um i i think that um i think that they they are difficult questions for those type of extreme views uh, to to face and part of the reason why uh, why i myself uh, am a little bit skeptical about the approach is that uh, i'm skeptical about uh, skeptical about relations themselves so so uh, uh, there's a nice paper by my my late uh, PhD supervisor E.J. Lowe, which is to say there are probably no relations. He's got this, uh, I think it's 2015 paper that that was uh, posthumously published or 2014 maybe. And I, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of why why that is the case, but uh, that's maybe a nice controversial uh, comment to to end this with. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, thank you very much for your time. Um, if people are interested to find out more either about um, the unity of science or hear more of your stuff or read more of your stuff, I mean, what kind of places can they go to to find that out? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Nathan. I've, en I've enjoyed the chat. Um, so uh, as mentioned, this book is, is open access. You can just download it from uh, the Cambridge Elements and Philosophy of Science website. So that, that's a good starting point. Um, other than that, I would recommend the work by my team um am i able to yeah you can share stuff. chat as well oh yeah you should be able to let me see i think i i can give you mod privileges which allows you to post in the link i was just gonna i, I was just gonna uh, post the, the link to the the project website um if you just say it's you and then i can give you the setting to it allow you to put links i can send it I, to, I can put that in the to you I have private oh, okay chat, I? yeah that's true you can do that as well um Cool. I've got it. Yeah, so uh, that that might be a good starting place. There's a section with with papers on the meta science website, um, and uh, you can you can find out more about the the, the team from there. Um, yeah, that's a, that's about it. Um, I'm sure I'm sure that the reference is there and will be will be more than enough. Okay, no problem. Well, I'll put those links anyway in the description. So if people are not watching this live, um, they'll be there for them to go and check out. I think the book is actually already there. Yeah, the, the book yeah, link is already is. there in the description. And I'll put I'll yeah. put this one there as well. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'll just play the closing credits. And if you want to hang around for a moment afterwards, then that's okay. Um, thank you, everyone. If you've enjoyed this, be sure to share it with people, um, especially people who might be interested in the unity of science, because, you know, there's a lot of discussions from people who are involved in the sciences about, you know, whether they um, 
how they do kind of line up and map together. And I think that this kind of philosophical discussion can be really good for, you know, people beginning to flesh some of those ideas out maybe rather than bringing, j just bringing kind of like prejudices that we might have in the first place, you know, to, to the conversation. So I think that this is a really good application of philosophy for even for those who might be um, skeptical of, of philosophy and its uses. I think that this is one area where, you know, people will be able to say this is, um, this is a, a good use of it. So, um, yeah, like, like the um, video and leave a comment if you, um, philosophy done right. There we go. So yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks very much, everyone. I appreciated the, uh, the questions as well.